in New York, I, in fact, I'm, I'm writing a piece on this now. In New York, there's a place called Le Petit Puppy. And what's really funny about Le Petit Puppy is that you can go and watch all these um, women or gay men, typically, who are going to look at the puppies because the puppies are so cute. And then you can watch all the women or gay or the men or, or, or gay men um, or women who are there to like, just to pick up the people looking at the puppies. Because what, if you're like looking at a puppy and then you look up, you're basically looking at the love of your life because the puppies trigger a doxytocin. And then there's a, a, a bench that's there to like, for people who just want to watch people picking up people who are looking at puppies. And so what's funny about that story is that that's a space story, actually. It's like, it's you've got a little un, unseen ecosystem. You think it's just cute puppies, but it's way more sophisticated than that. <laughs> I love that. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. At Traditional Medicinals, we believe that nature knows best. That's why we use medicinal grade herbs like echinacea to support your immune system, eucalyptus to help give you a breath of fresh air, and ginger to promote healthy digestion. Every which way we turn, Mother Nature is there to greet us with her amazing healing plants. Visit traditionalmedicinals.com and use code WELL20 to see what makes our teas so incredible. Fred, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I found out about your book by way of your publicist, um, Making Conversation, which, you know, in the time we're living in, obviously is a subject of tremendous interest to me and, and of tremendous importance. But before we get into all of that, I want to start asking what I think is a very fitting question, given the nature of your work. And that is what social group were you a part of in high school? And what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? That, but first of all, that's a great, great question um, because it's it's one that I often ask to kind of warm people up. Is I often ask them like, who were they in tw when they were twelve? Because I think it's a way to kind of really begin to see a different side of a person. Um, but so I'll, I'll I'll give you a really straight up honest answer. So I was a gay kid. My father was the headmaster of my school, um, and. I had to live a fairly closeted existence. So I dated the cheerleader, um, played soccer. I also did theater um, at the same time. And I I had to run away, basically. I, I did a structured running away to in from France, um, in France uh, to um to come out. And so I came out for a year and then and then went back to school and um came back to school and then went back in the closet. Um and what's what's interesting about that is that um it was a uh, I thought that I was like the weirdo, not popular kid. When I went back to my 25th anniversary, everyone was like, you were the one that held everybody together. Like you were the one who was, who was always crossing cultures between different kinds of people. So it was sort of an interesting, like retro perspective, which I didn't, I didn't have at that time. Does that answer yeah. the question? I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, obviously it raises more questions, but how old were you when you realized you were gay and, and what is that experience like? you know, when you're going through adolescence in contrast to, you know, being an adult um, where you're completely open about it and out of the closet? Well, I, I have a sense now, I have a sense that I actually knew I was gay since I was very, very, very young. Um, like, I think my first crush was Fred from Scooby-Doo, um, uh, which you don't even know who he is, but it's like, but he, he was, he was like this cartoon character. And so, um, so, but but I, I don't think I I, th I think I came to various levels of acceptance. Um, finally, what happened is that when my father left the school and my mom had this kind of severe stroke, I realized that I could. I no longer had the pressure to be the perfect child um, because I was also the oldest son, um, and so I I did this funny thing, which is that I um, I spent a day pretending that I was gay. I basically tried on the idea that I was gay and I spent a whole day walking around San Francisco, like going to gay bookstores, like talking to people. And it came out of it feeling just so emboldened and so strong by it that I actually, um, 
it's sort of, it just, I, I was like, I'm gay and it's time for me to come out. And so I did that. That's actually, by the way, the reason I ended up being, I think I told you I was homeless for a while because like my then, you know, partner kicked me out of the house because she was so, so furious for good reason. And, um, I, uh, I now tell people when they're going through really hard things. Like I have a friend who recently was like, she's a CEO of a company, but she's being, I, w- I would say, frankly bullied. And I basically was like, try pretending for a day that you're not there and that you're not the CEO of the company and see how you feel. And she did that. And it allowed her to basically say, yeah, I'm quitting. So that's a, that's sort of a, a long way of going. I will also say being gay politicized me, you know, so as you know, I, I, I worked with ACT UP, not, not for not a very satisfying way, but, um, you know, politics have always been embedded in the notion of my existence, just because, you know, during the eighties, during the eighties, I was pretty sure, even though I was, I was closeted that I would never probably ever sleep with a man because of, of my fear of AIDS. Um, and remember, we thought of that as genocide at the time. You know, that's that's the way yeah. we characterize the disease. So it, it's yeah. it's affected me in probably every aspect of my my being. So you know, I've asked this people to this question to people who have have been on the show who are also gay. Like when you come out, particularly to your closest friends and more importantly to your family, um, what is that experience like? Uh, and is it one of acceptance? Because, you know, I just had this guy, Stephen Goldstein here, who was actually our episode that we aired on uh, Monday of this week. And he, uh, you know, is a political consultant. He actually wrote this amazing book called The Turn On, How the Most Powerful People from Washington to Wall Street to Hollywood Make Us Like Them. And his experience was like quite traumatic. Like he never sort of had any sort of reconciliation with his family, which I just I found so sad. But um, at the same time, I know that that's reality. Like I, I think, you know, particularly with Indian parents, if you told them you were gay, that would definitely create a rift in the family. Um, yeah. So what is that experience like? Or has it was it like for you? Well, so my, my mom, my mother was quite accepting. Um, I never really told my father, like, it's like, I, um, I wasn't that close to my father. So I, I kind of like, um, I, I just I never could. Um, my mom found out because a picture of me kissing my boyfriend fell out of my book. And so she was like, she was like, I, moms do what they do. They're like, they're like, I always knew this is what was, this was, this is what the case was. And, um, but so that wasn't hard. Like if I were to be completely honest, you know, coming out to my partner, um, who frankly, um, you know, we were, we were, we were married. <laughs> it's like, it was, was like, a, it was like, was the hardest thing. Like, I felt like I really, really, really hurt her. We're, we're now, we're now quite close, but, it, but that was a, that was a really hard thing. Um, and I, I had been sleeping with men um, during that time. So ironically, liberal Berkeley um, daughter of therapists really open to sexual experimentation, but she was, she was livid and for good reason, you know, it's like, so like that, that that's, that, that's part of what got us to, to, to married in general. Um, but then I will say that, and it's part of this notion of making conversation I have carried it openly for the rest of my life. So I would be in the South in a very kind of radically religious work organization that I would be working with. And I would talk about being gay openly at dinner. And what I find is that if you're kind and warm and reasonably smart and you talk about things you want, like children or whatever, people start to identify regardless. And so I believe that there really is a need to be having the openness in the conversation, it's a brave thing to do. And, you know, I've certainly been in situations where people have threatened me. Um, and, and yet at the same time, I'm like, it is my responsibility to, to make, make it clear that, that, that I'm a gay man. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Cause like, I mean, the roommate I live with now after six years of being married, you know, found out his wife was gay. And I, I remember when he came over to tell me, I was like, Holy shit. Um, how do you even process that? You know, so it was, it was kind of, I, I mean, he's, you know, incredibly, uh, self-aware and I, I think self-actualized enough that he's done remarkably well with processing it. But, yeah. you know, after six years, like it still it is something that, it, you know, definitely shakes you because I think that particularly if you're married, you know, your entire future gets erased. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's exactly right. And you, you, you sort of, you believe that you'll, it's, it's one of those classic things. And it's actually like, even as we live post-election, it's one of these things where it's like, you feel like you'll never get, you're never gonna get past something, right? And then you do get past it. And then it's like, and the next thing that you think you'll never get past, and yet you do get past it. And so it's, it's really this kind of like, um, kind of like, that's what that's what life is, is just kind of like, always, always somehow kind of figuring out a way to keep, well, keep going. And so it's, and, and one of the things that about making conversation is that it helps us do that. 
Speaking of, of getting past things, there were two things that I wanted to ask you about. I know that you at one point lost your brother and then your mother had this awful stroke. Like, how do you find resilience um, in moments like that to keep going? Because I think to me, you know, the thought of, of losing a parent or a sibling, like in my mind, those are probably the most tragic things that I will experience in my life. Yeah. I mean, and a, a younger sibling, 10 years younger than me, who also, we had a very troubled relationship. So it was, it was even sort of stranger. And, and he died in a fairly vicious and spectacular car accident. Um, you know, I will say that, um, you know, at 24, when my mother, I was 24, when my mother had her kind of debilitating stroke, um, uh, it really, I, there's a couple of interesting things that happened. I had to, at that point to make to decide was I going to be by her side for the rest of her life to help her? Or was I going to be independent and live, live a life that was, that was somewhat free, even though she was, and she was suffering. And that was a hard decision to make. And a lot of people don't make the same decision I made. Right. Um, some people decide that they will stay by it, but I felt like to be utterly honest, my parents had not really raised me. Um, when I was a child, like I, I, for my first 10 years, I was raised by my great grandmother, which was very impactful for me. Um, at various points I was, farmed out to a really lovely um indian family um india from india like it's like the, who who raised me so like they didn't have much of a role in my childhood and so i felt so that's one thing but then knowing that my mom had had a stroke and that her do, her father had had a stroke at 30 and died it puts a time limit on your life so you basically are like i better make, take the best advantage of this life as I possibly can. And what's interesting about that is you would think it, it definitely led me to be driven and ambitious. And I'm definitely that, but more importantly, it led me to be like, I need to talk to everyone. I need to get to know every human that I can, because that's the best way to know, to understand this world. So that was a really powerful thing for me. And then the second piece about my brother, I will say is that that was, in, in fact, the hardest thing I've ever gone through. I mean, he called me on my birthday. He was in a car accident within hours afterwards. Um, he, it, was, it wasn't my birthday because my family could never get my birthday right. So they always thought my birthday was two days before. Um, so I had to get to the... My parents were like, we can't identify his body. We, we were so un, unhappy. We're like, we, they, were, they were so destroyed. So I had to fly there, drive through an ice storm. It took us two days and then the morning of my birthday, I had to go identify his body. And then this is, this is probably too graphic for you. Sorry. It's like, it's like, no, basically, uh, um, pry open the door of his car and, um, and, uh, and find his bloody phone. So I could actually get, get in contact with his, with his people. And so that, that I thought I wouldn't get through. However, I have a friend who's like deeply, her parents died at a very young age um and her her name is Deb and she um she happens to be also one of my publicists but she um she uh she got she walked me through it like step by step like she, everything to be like from like he, he here's how you can get his eyes donated like here's how you can do whatever to like here's how you're going to feel the next day to here's and what happened at that point is that it triggered this thing in me where my husband and I had been living in different cities. He'd been in Los Angeles. I'd been in San Francisco, but I'd been mostly in Washington because I was working with the Obama administration a lot. And um, we were like, this is stupid. Um, why are we living separately? So we moved, we moved within a couple months, we moved to New York because we were like, I couldn't work in LA. He didn't like San Francisco. And so I was like, okay, then let's, let's, let's go to New York. That's how we ended up on the East coast. Yeah. Well, walk me through um, what led to writing about a book about this. Of all the things you could write a book about, it's the only book that that I could write about. Oh, that's that's actually not true. I have an idea for another book, which um, um uh, which is making my agent crazy right now. She's like, just focus on the book you've got. But um, but um, uh, it's a uh, you know, I, there's a couple of things. Um, one was. Right after 2016 elections, I was working with the Surgeon General, the then for, for Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, um, and he was about to issue a epidemic of anxiety and loneliness in America, which I think would have been yeah. a groundbreaking. Um, I, I've read his book; it's phenomenal. Yeah, together, it's like it's. So he wrote that proposal for that book at the same time I wrote the proposal for my book um, because I was working with with Vivek on how to make town halls more cathartic. 
so literally the vec shankara vendum i think you 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 might know who, who, who does hidden brain and i did a conversation and then a creative tensions which is a form of dialogue that, that i do um at nbc i mean sorry at, at npr studio one like maybe a month or two after the or a month like right during the inauguration and it, it had about 500 people people from all kinds of political backgrounds range range or whatever and and we designed it so that well we actually originally designed it as a dating game but it ended up being much more cathartic than that we designed it so that like it felt like the whole room went through a giant catharsis um and that was what we were going to roll out as part of his town halls is instead of just doing town halls we wanted these cathartic community building moments um and so I gave a I gave a lecture on the degradation of dialogue in America because, as you know from reading the book, I believe that we go back to the forties, nineteen forties is kind of when when we really saw the dialogue um, start to de- degrade. And my agent called me and was like, "I think your book is this is your book." So here's here's the last funny story about that. So I wrote the book, which was phenomenal. But but when they when the book sold, my publisher was like, oh, your book right now is all about the degradation of dialogue in America. The book you have to write is has to be an entirely optimistic account of how we can have the hardest conversations of our life using creativity. That's a different book, right? <laughs> than, than what I what I thought. And so having to get to optimism took me three years of work. <laughs> so it's like, and and I'll be honest. I am relentlessly still optimistic, which I know you might be hard to believe given the moment we're in, because I've seen people get through the hardest conversations of their lives by just giving it a little bit of thinking and a little bit of um, design. Well, I, I, I think I love that because I think you, you've you just given me the title for our episode. But, um, <laughs> well, let's get into these seven essential elements. Um, you know, I know that, like, you know, in each element, there's also obviously these sub elements, and it would take us like an entire day to go through all of them. But you talk about commitment, and you say conversations first, beliefs second. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, that's, that's a tricky one, because I'll be honest, I, I'm more of I'm not really a writer. This is the first book I've written. Um, and, uh, um, and, and I had a story coach who who was instrumental in helping me do it. Like he would be, he was basically like a therapist. And then he would say, okay, write that in 800 words. You know, it's like, and then, and so, but, um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, I would give a lecture for Aspen about, about the, the book before it was written. Like, as I was trying to kind of work through some of the kind of structures and one of the questions that got thrown at me at the end, which of course should have come at me at the beginning was, yeah, but how do you talk to people who hate you? or just disagree with you, or don't want to talk to you. And I was like, ah, I don't know. And so I basically, I was like, I made this up. I was like, you need to just commit to the conversations and the people who are in the conversations first and hold your beliefs second. And um, it turns out that's like, an, that's a hard thing to ask someone to do, but you can do it. And so, as you know, in the book, I I went and looked at a bunch of organizations and places where people have committed to people who are have wildly divergent beliefs of from them. So there's, you know, I think my, one of my favorite stories in the book was the Dewey Academy, which is the story of the addicted teens. You know, I, I don't know if you remember that story, but these are teenagers now who are addicted to cutting. Um, boys are addicted to gaming and porn and the girls are addicted to cutting and, you know, it's like, it's very intense. And, um, but the, what's interesting about this Dewey Academy is that it's, Doors are unlocked. The kids can leave at any moment. This is very unlike most other um, schools for addicted youth. Um, and the only thing you have to do is say you're committed to being in the conversation and that you're committing to stay. And watching these, you know, 14, 15 year old kids struggling with these huge issues um, from all walks of life, sitting in a room together and committing to helping each other, like constantly, watching their parents who were from even more divergent perspectives. So first generation Chinese um, parents who basically were like, you, you can't be addicted. Like, it's like, it's like, you know, whatever it's like, but suddenly those families coming together and committing to each other um, was a remarkable experience. And so that's, by the way, that's not the same as having a conversation about politics, but it takes the same skills, which is like, it takes commitment. And it's, it takes saying, like, we can be in this conversation together and we are going to be committed to you. And even if we disagree, like, I'm still there for you. Um, and that's really the kind of core component of what commitment is all about, 
is kind of doing that. And then, as you know, because like the book is like this, it's like commit until you can't, you know? So my other, my other point on that is like, if you can't commit, then don't. And the conversation will be better off for, for it. Like, it's like, I have like far too many organizations where people are like, oh, I hate the organization, but it's important that I'm on their board because I'm the one who's continuously like challenging every new idea. And I'm like, yeah, no, maybe get off the board. Um, it's like, it's because you're actually making it a lot harder for the rest of us who are really committed to this organization. So, um, so I, I mean, I, and it's the same thing. Like if you, I had a young black woman who works in HR at a, a at a giant um, investing firm. And she was really asking me about triggering. Like, she's like, she's like, I noticed that there are certain things that trigger me. And how do I stay committed in a conversation where I've been triggered? And um, I told her the story that's in the book on, in the chapter on commitment of moving to New York. My husband wasn't there yet. We were on the fifth floor walk up of a, of a loft in Tribeca. I had like, I literally had people just kind of like hauling furniture up the stairs all day long you know, moving is really emotional. Like I'm in New York. It's like, I'm like standing in the little living room about to cry anyway. And someone comes pounding on the door and is screaming through the door. And I open the door and it's um, this little, you know, I would say five foot four woman. And she's like, just screaming. She's like, you've broken every rule of our building. Like I've had to listen to your movers all day long. It's like, and like, you know, you, you, uh, just the noise of you walking around up here is making me crazy. And I've lived in this building for 25 years. I'm going to have you like sued. And I just felt rage. Like I was like, I could feel, I, cause I was like, I, I, the trigger for me was like, she, I'm a wuss from California and I'm going to just kind of capitulate to her and just say like, I'm so sorry. Cause that's what that would be my first gut. And then, but I was so mad that I'd met this kind of quintessential nasty New York neighbor. And I was like, I'm being triggered. Like, I just, I was like, I just like took a breath and I was like, this is a trigger. And I turned to her and I said, is this the conversation you really want to have? And she stopped and she said, no, this is not the conversation that I want to have. And so we had this like, lovely conversation where we talked about the neighborhood. We talked about things and we became friends from then on out. I mean, like she saved my life, no joke during hurricane Sandy. Um, and came and sat and drank wine with us for the whole night. Um, so I think there's real value. And so that was a great example where I realized the trigger. I could have like easily ended the friendship that, that never, or would have never began a friendship, um, by just kind of like, lashing back out and we would have been at war for a long, long time. But by pausing, realizing I was being triggered, asking, asking in essence for the conversation I wanted to have, which was a nice conversation, um, we were able to get there. So, you know, okay. even, even places where you feel like you can't commit, you can, if you, if you're, if you're, if you're good, uh, if you just, if you just try. Well, so <clears throat> Speaking of triggers, um, I think it makes a perfect segue to this idea of courage and conversation, but the trigger in particular, and I knew I wanted to ask you about this based on the, the content of your book. Um, <clears throat> I think any one of us who has ever been in a relationship with a significant other, the moment you hear the words, we need to talk, you're like, fuck that. <laughs> like, I know where this is going. Like, this is going to be over and I don't want it to be. Like, I literally, every time, uh, you know, in, in my mind, I've always said, next time a woman sends me a text that says we need to talk, I'm like, no, can you just finish the breakup now so we don't have to talk about this? <laughs> Uh, so that to me, that's the example that I think of, like in a situation, like basically how do I stop being triggered by that? Yeah. I mean, so here's a funny thing. So it's like my husband and I had an agreement that, um, that when gay marriage became legal, uh, around all everywhere in America that we would get married. So that happened. I was happened to be an Aspen. This is just a little funny aside. I happened to be an Aspen. I had my whole team working with me. They were like, I was like, let's get to Tiffany's. Let's get an engagement ring. Like, it's like, I, I want to be able to like ask him to marry me when I get back um, on July 4th, like on the pier of our farm upstate. And so I, I have all this work going. And then my husband texts me and he's like, Hey, I guess we should get married. And so I started texting back being like, we need to talk. <laughs> and like, literally the woman who was sitting next to me, um, one, one of my, my, my media people, grabbed my phone and was like, let me take care of this. You are not texting. We need to talk when like, it's like, because it's like, cause he's going to misread that. And so like, they took care of all my communications with my husband after that. So, um, so we have to be really, I, so one of the things we have to be careful is like, 
is, well, first of all, don't, don't text that. <laughs> it's like, so it's like, just like, just right off the bat, as you go into agreements with people who you're having relationships with, like, just like ask them, like, just if they're not going to, if, the, if they're going to text it, just call or just like, or just, or don't like, it's like, that's the first thing. Like that's, that's kind of a bit, it's an act of aggression. <laughs> to be honest, it might, it might seem like it's like, it's, 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 you know, it's an act of, of great communication, but it's not. Um, so that's the first thing you can do is you can ask the people you, you're involved with and your friends and whatever, to just like to, if they, if they ever want to talk to you just to call and say, can we talk? I will also say that there are in my world, I have a rule that when you say something like, I have feedback or I need to talk to you or I need to give you some, 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 uh, I have to tell you how I feel about something you've done. Once I do that, I always, and you, you probably might remember this from the book. I always then hand the power over to the person who I'm doing that to and say, what are the things that you feel like you just can't hear from me today? Or what are the things you just can't talk about? And so in a situation like that, like a per, you could say, I can deal with anything. I just like, in the wake of the elections, I just can't hear you're going to break up with me today. It's like, you know, it's like, so, so, but, but that takes, that again, takes you and, and your partner, you and, and the person you're working with kind of establishing the rules that basically say, like, if I'm going to give you feedback, I first hand you the rules to tell me what I can't give you feedback on. Right. So, yeah. and, and I have a question. Does every time... Every time someone says, do we need to talk? Are they, are they, is it because they want to? Today's sponsor is brought to you by Nature Made, the number one pharmacist recommended vitamin and supplement brand. Nourish by Nature Made is a personalized vitamin regimen that removes the guesswork of selecting supplements that are specific to you. Backed by 45 years of science, delivered right to your doorstep and costing on average less than $2 a day. Nourish is your one-stop shop for customizable supplements. Visit Nourish.com to get started today. So this has been a really tough year for all of us with everything that's been happening in the world. And in the 10 years that I've been working on Unmistakable Creative, there have been epic highs and unimaginable lows. But it took me years before I realized that it was okay to ask for help. Whether you're trying to build something or dealing with problems in your personal life, we could all use someone to talk to. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp Online Counseling offers licensed professional therapists who are trained to listen and help with issues including anxiety, grief, depression, self-esteem, family issues, and much more. All you have to do is fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs and then get matched with your counselor in under 48 hours. You can easily schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus exchange unlimited messages to communicate with your therapist at your convenience. And everything you share is confidential. And if for any reason you're unhappy with your counselor, you can request a new one at any time for no additional charge. Join the 1 million plus people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced BetterHelp counselor. BetterHelp is an affordable option, and our listeners get 10% off your first month with the discount code Unmistakable Creative. So get help today at betterhelp.com slash unmistakable creative. Talk to a therapist online and get help. Seth Godin once described the internet as a fountain of knowledge, and you have so many opportunities to give yourself an education that kicks the crap out of the one you got in school. If you want to satisfy your thirst for knowledge, one way is Skillshare. And they have classes on just about everything. Former Unmistakable Creative guest Andy Pizza has a class called Find Your Style, Five Ways to Unlock Your Creative Identity. Another awesome class is Creativity Unleashed, Discover, Share, and Hone Your Voice Online. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. So you can spend hours each day scrolling through social media or start making progress towards your creative goals with Skillshare. And Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to a lot of those pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash create and get a free trial of their premium membership. Again, that's Skillshare.com slash create. Break up with you? Well, it's historically, yes. I mean, it's usually like, and it, you know, luckily it hasn't been, you know, via text, but still the moment I hear those words, I'm like, like in my mind, I like literally I can just feel my, my heart start to race, you know, my breathing get shallower, you know, like everything that you experience when you kind of know that, oh, okay. You know, I mean, the weird thing is like, 
I, I think for the most part, I've been the one to end all of the relationships that I've been in and the ones that I didn't want to have end were obviously those situations. But um, I, I think that, you know, in my mind, I think I formed the association of those words and a bad, you know, a bad outcome. Well, yeah. And, and re- re- recognize the, the word, the words themselves are right. We need to talk like it's like that's that, there's nothing wrong with the words. It's just that it's yeah. the, it's where, where they're placed is the, is, is the problem. Um, and so so like. Like I would say, full on embrace the fact that we all need to talk, but that's not the that's that's not the intent of what those words are in, in in that in that circumstance. I mean, how have you? Hand- I mean, here's the other thing to do, which is that I talk about you know brave, and this, I think I told you or in the book you you probably realize that it's like I had the word brave tattooed over my heart when my brother died because historically. Um, chefs he was a chef they're, they're overly tattooed he was very much into tattoos so as, as i was trying to think about something i could do that would pay tribute to him so i i put brave over my heart and that was to remind me not to be brave like go climb a mountain or you know fly fly solo over the ocean like what i call like amelia Earhart brave but to be brave like don't be afraid to stand up to the things when you see when you see them happen you know and i i have a um I have a friend who really believes the opposite, Mary Gentili, who has this incredible book called Giving Voice to Values. And she, her belief is that people don't identify um, as courageous. And I think that's probably true. And that's why I kind of, I qualify it as everyday bravery. It's like the small acts of bravery. So, you know, I mean, what's the worst that happens? You, you hear some bad stuff, you know, it's like, and like I said, it, it'll go, it'll get, you'll get past it. You know, and it's like you'll 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 make your life. It's like um, and and I don't know. I have a history where everyone I've ever fired. This isn't exactly true with everyone I've ever broken up with. It's mostly true, but it's like but um or been broken up with um by um but everyone I fire um we're still really good friends. Like it's like and so it's like so I think the testimony to the idea that like even if I'm like saying you have to go. I'm still saying to you, but I'm committed to you. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm going to be there. Or I have people who, who I, I fired, but they like convinced me, let them come back for like a week and were changed people. And like, are like, I was just on the phone with like one who's, who's now like genius working at YouTube, doing like super amazing things. But it's like, and, but she was basically like my, my understudy, like at IDEO. And like, and, but, but when she left, I was like devastated, but I was like, awesome like it's like you 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 go be the most amazing thing you can be so i would just say like it's like there's this notion of being a, a benevolent force in the world um and just trying to help which i think is 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 embedded in this making conversation you know it's last thing i'll say is i, I was really surprised when adam grant put it on his 30 books to read in the fall but that's only because like I've known Grant and Adam Grant when he wrote Give and Get, because I think I texted him and I was like, hey, I really love this book. And so I didn't realize that Adam Grant was famous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, yeah, like, Adam's been a guest here. Is, is, Adam is so nice. Yeah. And so literally, I'm like, I basically like, I like, I think I'm texting Adam at like during this thing being like, hey, I think it's to your credit that I had no idea that you had this kind of fame. And and he's like, yeah, I think I think you're complimenting me. And I was like, yes, I'm complimenting yeah. you. I just thought he was just like some nice guy who just like was doing lots of nice things, you know. So yeah. well, let's uh, let's get into the other other elements. Um, talk to me about the concept of creative listening. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot in that. Um, I, I will say that there's a originally this came out of work I was doing at IDEO and then kind of it's a hybrid of that and frankly, my great grandmother is kind of like, kind of like other things that, and my mother that, that inspired me. So, so just to give you a sense, originally, originally this came out of the work with idea where I felt like teams weren't listening anymore. Like they were just typing. And I was like, I was like, you cannot be in a situation like this where you're not like paying attention to the social cues of what someone's saying to you, not just like writing down everything they're saying. And by the way, it's okay to take notes. It's okay to do doodle. It's okay to knit. It's okay to do a bunch of different things while you're listening to somebody. Those make you better listeners. Typing doesn't make you a better listener. Um, and so, uh, and then there's scientific evidence around that. So I was like trying to get my teams to kind of stop listening. And I, I basically was like, 
oh, my mom was a really good listener. So I was like, my first thought was like, hey, listen like my mother or listen like your mother. And what I realized is that everyone's mothers don't listen the same way my mother listened. Like my mother was a tremendous listener, right? Um, but that's because she was born in a, a family raised by a, her brother was deaf. Like it was mostly silent um, in that family because they wanted to respect the brother. And so she just became this phenomenal listener who then, of course, ironically, when she had her stroke, became aphasic, which made listening incredibly hard to do. Um, and so that wasn't going to work. And so I feel like I had to kind of find more scientific methodologies or reasons and why. So I, I went and looked at Quaker methodologies. I looked at um, of, of, of kind of listening to yourself and listening to the other person at the same time, which is that's why Quakerism lets women preach and always has is because like the idea is like that if God's been God's been speaking to you, He's been speaking to you always, and so it's this is it's it sort of allows for the notion of you know have some judgment in a conversation, so not just that you're agreeing with somebody when you're listening. I looked at the practice of secrets and how how short something can be, and I'll I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Um, and and basically, I mostly was looking at this as saying like, by the way active listening, which is what's most frequently taught, the kind of like, uh-huh, go on, that, that kind of listening, which has been adopted by HR all around the, the world, basically, um, really sucks. Like active listening, I mean, apologies, you're having to listen to me more, but in this case, it's sort of like an interview, so otherwise we'd be more in conversation. But um, but um, active listening comes out of Rogerian therapy, which was invented in like the 50s by this guy named Carl Rogers kind of a genius. He, he, he invented multiple therapeutic tools, um, this being one of them. And his, his belief was psychoanalysis um, and Freudian and Jungian therapies kind of assume that there's only one solution to somebody's problems, um, whereas he felt like there were a myriad solutions and only the individual could unlock what, the, what those solutions were. And so that's where Rogerian therapy began active listening. It was kind of like, you know, it would be like, are you unhappy? Or, 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 t- or tell me how you're feeling. And then someone would say, well, I'm feeling unhappy. And they're like, well, why are you unhappy? And they're like, well, I'm feeling unfulfilled. And they're like, well, what, what makes you unfulfilled? And they would say, my job. And they're like, well, why are you in your job? And so it's like, that's kind of the, that would be it. That was active listening. And even that, you can tell, is just more, that's more sophisticated than saying, uh-huh, go on, that kind of listening. Um, but when we started pulling that into like the business context, where it was really an excuse for, for employers not to have to listen to their employees um, or you not to have to listen to me or me not to have to listen to my husband. Um, that's where it got really problematic. And so, and it's funny, I'm doing a lot of podcasts with a lot of people who are coaches and facilitators, and they're all so surprised by my rejection of active listening. And I'm just like, it's like, it's like, it wasn't meant for this. It was meant for something. Yeah. Else. And, 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 you know, yeah. The book's pretty anti-methodology. It's like, it's like, just make up your own way of doing it. You know, it's like, that's, that's the smart way to think about it. Well, it's funny, funny you say that. Cause like, I think about how I interview people and it's not, you know, it's, it's almost the opposite of that, you know, as opposed to, yeah, active listening. It's just, okay, I'm kind of following a thread of where you're taking this, but building questions as we go. Um, and so, I mean, in the interest of time, I want to cover all the other stuff here too. Um, but we got to figure out a way to do it, um, using constraints ironically, but, uh, <laughs> You get into clarity, clarity, and, and I think that the correct me if I'm wrong, but the the summary in my mind of clarity was don't use jargon to describe things because in every context, you know, you gave the example of a hospital, and you know, I, I think about my sister is you have this sort of language that you speak, and I, I know this because when I speak to authors or you know people who are in this field, we almost have this this lexicon that to the outside world sounds like absolute nonsense. It's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Well, and ironically, clarity was, you know, publishers love C's, like seven C's. So originally clarity yeah. was actually called um, Talk Normal because it was like, I was like, what's the best way to say? And originally the book was called Talk Normal. Um, and uh, it's like, but my most embarrassing edit, the thing that my editors didn't catch is that if you notice in that, in that first chap, that first paragraph of clarity, I think I used the word obfuscates like in in that. And I was just like, I was like, oh, great. So start a, start a chapter on clarity. And then you use the word obfuscate, like, like in the first thing, but, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're getting it exactly right. But however, I want to be a, I want to do a caveat. When your sister 
is talking to other healthcare workers about the safety and life of a patient. Your sister should use any jargon or scientific language she needs to be able to communicate efficiently and fast to, 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 the, to that person. So that, that that's like, so what you don't want is a bunch of doctors who are like, get the heart circle pumper thing. You know, like, you know, it's like, don't, don't, right. you, know, it's like, you, you want them to like, like say, say the word that everybody else is going to understand. That's like, it's like, you, you, like, don't stumble over like how to say something in a paragraph. So it's clear to like, you know, um, clear to them. However, when a, when a physician or an MD or someone is talking to you as a patient, they have to kind of like undo that kind of that specialized language and really be able to kind of speak in the most common language. So that is where you would say, again, I don't think it's as simple. It has to be as simple as, as it's, it's not like trying to get to like using the hundred most common words, which is like, you know, a kind of funny little game you can play, but it's like, it, it, it can be like, you know, this this steth- stethoscope is going to li- it lets me hear your heartbeat a little better you know it's like it's like just like explain what the what the language is um and then what you see is that hardcore like i'm going to go see a friend of mine who has um she's been had suffered from cancer for four years and you know she she knows this inside and out like she knows the language by now you know she knows so it's like so she she's she's taught herself it but but you know there's some People who are the same same thing who never learn it. So, so we just have to, kind of, we have to amend ourselves based on 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 how willing we are to go there. So, yes. So the the, the point here is really strive for clarity. Don't do it. But but if you need it, if you need specialized language to kind of like if you're like a oceanographer talking to an oceanographer, or a climatologist talking to a climatologist, pandemicist talking to a pandemicist, you 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 do you like that's fine. But if you're a pandemicist talking to the movement for Black Lives. Or if you're a um, oceanographer talking to um, your grandmother, like it's like then then tone it down. If you can, <laughs> is basically is basically the idea there. And then it, the last thing I'd say is like, and then acronyms. Those aren't those aren't um, those aren't words. So don't yeah. just dump them. <laughs> it's like, okay, so um, well, let's let's talk about context. I, I think that you know, to me, it's always interesting to talk to people, uh, particularly those who worked at IDEO. When you, you think about space, because I've read all the IDEO books, I've read you know the Design Thinking book, the Creative Confidence Theme book, and I am obsessive about the environments that I live and work in because they affect the way that I work so much. But I, I think that you know, looking at it through the context of conversation, I, I remember. Um, we had uh, Wallace Nichols, a guy who wrote a book called Blue Mine, and we were talking about water because we're both avid surfers. Hmm. And he was kind of explaining to me that, you know, if you go near a body of water, it changes the the, you know, the context of the conversation. And so I was like, good to know. Every time I have a date from now on, I'll try to make sure it's near a body of water. Um, <laughs> and so you, I, I think the thing that really struck me most, and, uh, you know, um, if you can give us like a quick summary of this, because there's a couple other things I want to get to before you know, we have to wrap things up. Um, you talk about circles, reclining, standing up and getting grounded. And I, it's funny because I'd heard the circle thing before from an architect that we had here uh, who came to talk to us about designing creative spaces. But can you expand on the whole idea of context? Yeah, I definitely can. And I, and I will say like, actually, when you, you, what you should do with the, on a first date or whoever is um, you should actually go look at puppies um, because puppies um, t- trigger oxytocin. Um, Good and, to know. I will keep that in mind. And, it's yeah. funny because my 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 uh, you know one of my partners, Milena, she's like, you pretty much only do things. You use people's advice to like you know uh, apply yeah. to your own life for your own personal gain. I'm like, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, no. I mean, so like a great space example is that in in New York. I, in fact, I'm I'm writing a piece on this now. In New York, there's a place called the Petite Puppy, and what's really funny about the Petite Puppy is that you can go and watch all these. Um, women or gay men typically who are going to look at the puppies because the puppies are so cute. And then you can watch all the women or gay or the men or, or, or gay men um, or women who are there to like, just to pick up the people looking at the puppies. Because what, if you're like looking at a puppy and then you look up, you're basically looking at the love of your life because the puppies trigger a doxytocin. And then there's a, a, a bench that's there to like, for people who just want to watch people picking up people who are looking at puppies. And so what's funny about that story is that that's a space story, actually. It's like, it's, you've got a little un, unseen ecosystem. You think it's just cute puppies, but it's way more sophisticated than that. And that's like, <laughs> I love that. You only see that if it's like, if you, if you step, if you, if you spend 10 minutes watching it, you'll be like, wait a second, there's something entirely different. And the owners know this. That's why they face this bench there. So people can watch this happening. Um, so. So, but, but basically, 
my perspective on space, I'm an architect by by training, is that spaces have set the script already. So um, you can go to court and it's going to be pretty hard to reset the script of the way a courtroom functions, right? I mean, it's like like it's 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 been established for a certain kinds of conversations. You can take the trial out of the courtroom, and you can have a completely different outcome. But the courtroom itself establishes the parameters of of the way it works, and that's true. That's obviously a really kind of obvious example, but that's true of boardrooms. That's true of AA meetings. That's true of like your own kitchen table. Um, I I too am an adamant believer in space. I also I love space as a way into these conversations because everybody has them or everyone's been in them. And so, you know, it's like people might not understand that products are designed. Like I had no idea that people design products. I thought they just fell off trees um, when I, when I moved to idea, but, but I was, but people by inherently know like space and they may not design the space the way you want their space to be designed, but they, they're designing the space the way that they want it to be designed. So, so they're, they're just like it really, as I talk about in the book, space sets the script. And what you don't want to do is unwittingly play to someone else's script that you don't want to. Because the other interesting thing about space, and sorry, we'll get to circles in a second, is that, well, this this is a great segue into into circles, is that mnemonics, mnemonics use space to make memories. So our brain um, associates a space with with, um, certain memories. That's why I can say, where were you on 9-11? And you'll remember. And it's why, for instance, if you were in bed um, waking up, you may not want to have conversations with your lover or partner um, at the same time in bed, even now, because it's like that space might be haunted by the mnemonics of what of what what happened during nine eleven. Um, like like um, so so like just out of character. I mean, do, where were you nine eleven? Can you remember? I very distinctly remember I was uh, on the one hundred and one freeway driving from San Francisco to Milpitas to go to the job that I hated with a passion. Yeah. I was I was in a I was in the mission the mission Safeway parking lot going to Pete's. I was about to go on drive time radio, which I was like sickened by. And I was like, I wish anything would happen so that I didn't have to go on drive time radio. And I walked out and everyone was crying in the parking lot. And I was like, what's going on? And I got a call from my publicist being like, they don't want you on drive time radio this morning. <laughs> so it's like, but I mean, like that's it. The, the mnemonic um, element is like the space is like is like is tied to it really rigorously. And so um, what you want to do is make sure that you're resetting the mnemonics or establishing new mnemonics. That's why I sort of suggest like have hard conversations over breakfast or go for a walk or, you know, do, do things like that. But it's also like, I'll say really, really honestly in the COVID era, you'd think this doesn't matter, but it really does. Like um, my husband and I, for instance, at the end of the day, I insist that we make the, t- the, make the table, like set the table together. Um, and it makes him crazy, but I'm like, all your cables, he's an AI artist, and like all these little robots and gadgets and whatever, get them off the table. Like, it's like, take the computers off, take the phones off. We're going to put down a tablecloth. We're going to sit down. We're going to, you know, set it. And he's just like, this is ridiculous. I'm like, no, we're setting the table for the conversation we want to have. Um, and so even now there's basic things about the ways that you're establishing it. Um, like the, the spaces that yeah. really matter. So, yeah. Think well, about it let's, as you get, let's actually, get it. yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. So, I mean, in the interest of time, um, I, you know, there's one other area that I wanted to cover and I'm hoping that we can talk about constraints and change in the context of this, um, principles for conversations in a virtual world. And I, I thought the best way to do this would be with an actual a practical example. So every week or I think every two or three weeks, we host, um, office hours for our community of, of, you know, prime members, um, basically, which is our, our paid membership program for people who want to make ideas happen. And I was thinking about this because we do this Zoom meeting. And so I was like, okay, wait a minute, you have expertise on this. So how would we, you know, like incorporate change and constraints into that? And also the principles you talk about for conversations in the virtual world, which I realize I'm asking you like six questions in one. No, that's cool. Tell me how many people are coming to those conversations. You know, I mean, it ranges from 10 to 15. Um, so they're not massive, but they're not tiny either. And and so I'll tell you right now what the structure is. It's kind of a, uh, you know, hot seat where everybody tells us, you know, what they're working on, what their challenges are. And then uh, my community manager and, and Melina and I offer feedback and, and, you know, whatever we know to be able to help them get past that. Yep. 
So, I mean, it's like that, 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 that sounds pretty good. So like, it's like, it's like you're, you're starting, you're starting from a good place. I mean, as you know, like, so what's interesting about the, the, the four um, little principles for the, how to have, the, it's really like how to have the hardest conversations over Zoom during a pandemic, which I had to write in an afternoon because I had been, I had written these principles March 1 when my teams went on, when I knew we were going to go online. And the, that chapter is kind of a recap of the entire book. It's like, I think it's kind of like a, it's like a film trailer because it's like, it doesn't give away the whole book. I kind of love it. By the way, we have that as an excerpt that we can send to you and all your listeners. So if it's okay. useful, the thing, it's, it's just four pages. Yeah. So it's, I think, I think it's pretty useful. So let's just go through what those four are. And then I'll, I'll tell you how that, so, so basically it's commit or don't, which should sound familiar. And it's, and it's basically like now the best time in the world, if you can't help a conversation go forward, then step out of the conversation and make more time in your life. That's totally cool. And so it's like, if you had gotten on and we're like, I don't have time for this, I'd be like, fine, like we'll, we'll do it some other time or we'll never do it. Except if you're the only voice of difference. And so I think if you're like, you're the only black woman um, at this big financial organization, like you have to figure out how you can stay in. Um, except for when you can't, like, if it feels really unsafe, then step out. So, you know, that, that's what, that's the nuance is like, everybody's like, just give us the one tip or trick. And I'm like, well, here's the tip or trick, but only until it's no longer applicable. And it's the opposite. Like, I just like, I don't want to, I don't want you to hurt yourself in, in any way. Right. Like it's like conversations are amazing, but they can also be dangerous places. So, so it's that. And right now I think, you know, with my teams, I was like, Day one, there's wild card days. You guys have a bad day. Like, like I today, I'm like, I thought nobody would want to do anything. And everybody's like, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm doing life hacker after this. And like, they're like, we want to talk more than ever today. You know, it's like, so what's interesting is that, um, uh, so that's, that's the first one. Um, the second one is break the rules, all the rules. So that goes to the constraints. So the constraints was always about breaking the rules or re- or setting and resetting the rules. And my, my, my first premise was like, these aren't like normal conversations. You can break every rule, right? So it's like, it, it doesn't really matter. It's okay. Um, and so it's a good moment to be experimenting with the rules that you have. Um, the third one is asynchronous is okay. So it's, I talked about the fact that like being in a Google Doc with somebody can feel like you're in a conversation with them. Like my editor um, and I are so comfortable in Google Docs that like, he'll be like, hey, you know, there's something wrong with your brain. And I think that's hysterical. And it's like, as though I was just sitting and talking to him. Um and then the last one is get real about designing the human in. Um, and so one of the things we lose through these mediums is our humanity. And so um, you might have to kind of purposefully de- design that human in. And so, for instance, when I do lectures right now, like I did a lecture for a big organization in Berlin, or I'm doing one for Creative Mornings, um, which is uh, Tina Roth Eisenberg's um, uh, uh, thing. Uh I'll have my husband just drop in and say he loves, he, like, hey, tell Creative Mornings that you love them. And David says, hi, I love you. And like, and that's pre-planned. It's me kind of like purposely designing the human in. Um, and so, which, which is something that I think you need to do in, in all cases. Um, so I, I think, I, I think that's, th- those, those things can be helpful for you. I think um, with what you're doing, it sounds like, it, it, it's almost a kind of therapeutic practice um, in, in the way that you're going at, which I, which I think is a really nice thing. I, I think let's go to like the change thing, which is that what might be really good is, as you know, from reading the book, the chapter on change is that change only works if you notice when it's happened. Right. So it's like, so it's like when you see somebody kind of shift their perspective or you see, if, if you're giving somebody a piece of advice and like you see them actually kind of take that piece of advice in and so what you might do is consider having one of the people who works with you just sit and watch the screen and sort of see if like watch for people who it looks like they've kind of they've, they've taken that something in and they're like, oh, wait, there's something there. And and so that's kind of like a witnessing um, and then call out like, oh. Susan, it looks like you experienced a kind of a, a realization, as, as I was saying, do you want to talk about what you what just happened? And that's a really important thing for us to do right now, because it's like, unless it's explicit, it's, it's always hard to spot change when it happens. Um, but now in a Zoom context, unless you're like really looking for it, you, you need to kind of ask for it. Um, so that's one thing that I might consider thinking about whether or not you might add a role or add a tool or add a rule that basically is saying like, when I feel changed, I'm going to call it out. Um, or if, if I feel like you're changing, 
I'm going to, I'm going to see if that's true. Um, and the reason that's important is that it's that change that allows the group to kind of then activate, to go to the next step, which ultimately is creation, which is kind of like, as you know, the last final chapter is really like it, like just make, you know, and, and actually the short line of the chapter, the last chapter is if you can't talk, then just make like, I mean, there's a lot of other things in that, but, but the reality is let's say you can't talk to your Trump or Biden voting um, relatives, then don't like just make together. Or, you know, I have, I have one person who listened to one of my lectures who's um, been telling me that she asked her father-in-law to teach her how to play golf, even though she doesn't want to learn how to play golf, but it's the way for them to connect and, commun- and communicate now. So um, just something to bear in mind, given, given, the weeks and months we have ahead, um, which which is going to be, you know, it can t- continue to be as challenging as we can imagine. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I have so enjoyed talking to you. So I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Say that one more thing. What is it? What do I think it is that makes someone, somebody, or something unmistakable? Is that unmistakable. right? Unmistakable. Yes. Um, well, so I am gonna I'm gonna tell you a little story because we have we have like a couple minutes, like three minutes or something. Am I right? So, yeah, I'm gonna just tell you. So, yeah, um, I'm yeah. gonna tell you my my favorite story, which is my great grandmother's story. So, um, my great grandmother used to. She was a steel worker by night. Um, and a farmer by day. And she used to come home in the mornings, like, and then have to feed all her field hands and then like, she like go from there. And she, and she told me the story while we were sitting on a little bench or a little, a little, um, swing in the backyard. And she basically said, one night I was, I, I came home in the morning and I was walking up the long drive and I could gradually see this blue thing hovering in the air above me. And it was getting closer and closer and I remember thinking, I have no strength to go on. I, I'm probably going to have to lay, like lay down the weary load, which is the kind of thing my grandmother would say, great grandmother. And then it, I realized it was Jesus and he winked at me and I was able to go on. So that to me is an example of a perfect story um, because it is, it tells you everything you need to know about her. And yet it tells you nothing. And it leaves you with a complete surprise. And it complete, it's like, it's the best cliffhanger ever. Right. And it's like, it's got like the twist that like that we like from Black Mirror, you know, it's like, but it also tells you about her values and it tells her that that tells you that she's a religious woman and that's how she persisted. And then if I add to that, this fact that like, she called me Hollywood all through my, 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 my 10, like my nine, my, my eight through 10 years. And she did that, I think, because she knew I was gay. And for her, Hollywood was a way to kind of acknowledge my gayness. So what I would say is that kind of elemental, pure human story is unmistakable. You can see my grandmother's soul in that story. Um, you, can see, you can see who she was in that. So I really ask you to start to practice those, those stories. Like tell a 30-second story. I did a, I did a lecture for the media lab that was supposed to be like 55 minutes. And I, I, I was like, Hey, I'm going to give you 50 minutes and I'm just going to tell you how to teach you how to tell a, a, like a short, 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 short story. And I did it in five minutes and gave him back the hour, which was like, I have to say a complete and utter stunt, but it was, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> it's like, so it's like, but anyway. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your wisdom and insights with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, um, your book, your work, and everything else that you're up to? I think the easiest way to go is go to makingconversations.com. Um, uh, obviously, buy the book. And then obviously, um, uh, subscribe, because we're actually we're, we're coming up with a little WhatsApp curriculum. It's going to be like 30 seconds of, of video that prompts you to do something every day. Um, and I think it's going to be really fun and easy. Um, and uh, and then there's all kinds of other information about me, about my work, and about my my team is not up there yet. But I've got a genius team behind me that's that's making this so much more fun. Amazing. Uh, and for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive? 
maybe even heartwarming. Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. ACAST powers some of the world's best podcasts. Here's a show we recommend. I'm Ned Fulmer. And I'm Ariel. We're from the Try Guys, and we have a new podcast called Baby Steps. It's an irreverent parenting podcast because parenting is not perfect. We just had a newborn, baby Finn. I got pooped on. Ariel has pink eye. <laughs> I don't have a big guy. <laughs> we talk to some experts. We even bring you 4 a.m. thoughts from our garden. Oh my gosh, it's literally 4 a.m. Just to, to go back here, I thought I got poop in my eye. Yeah. And that causes pink eye. Parenting is a mess. We're a mess. You're a mess. Join us every Sunday. Listen to Baby Steps on ACAST or wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST, A-cast. 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 recommends. <laughs>